everybody. This is a great turnout for uh, a Sunday afternoon. It is nice to see that there are a lot of folks that are interested in our early history. Uh, sometimes some of the younger folks don't seem to be, but maybe they just have to get a little older, right? <laughs> Not that this is an old love. Uh, I'm John Devon, I'm one of the volunteers here at the Homestead, and uh, I know several of you personally, but for those of you that are new, uh, welcome. Uh, this afternoon, we have Robert Grandchamp, who will be speaking, as you probably know, on the uh, Burgoyne's Invasion of 1777. Robert is the author of a dozen books on the American on American military history. He earned his Master in Arts degree in American History from Rhode Island College. He is a former National Park Ranger, and for the past seven years, he has been an analyst with the Immigration Service. So I hope all of you are... Uh, citizenship papers are in order. He'll be checking you out when you leave here today. So. Uh, Robert was a member of the 24th Foot British Unit, and I was going to put that in here that he is, but now he is a father, and his, uh, his daughter Addison is five months old today, and putting his priorities in order, he is no longer a reenactor uh, with the British 24th foot. So I guess he's on leave for the time being. So without further ado, Robert, if you are out there. Oh, right here. All right. Oh, thank you. Thank you for Channel 17 for being here to record our talk. You'll all, those of you that have email will be getting a notice of when that talk will be broadcast. And also, there's, there's a link that you can watch it at your convenience on your computer. And we also want to thank Vermont Federal Credit Union for being a generous sponsor for the for our talks. All right, Robert, can I have yours? Uh, firstly, I apologize. I was uh, hoping to have a computer projector and a laser pointer, but uh, technology issues resorts to a map and a sword. So. Go, uh, go figure. And I happen to just have this in my car. Um, so, what the events that transpire here in the Champlain Valley in the summer and fall of 1777 are probably well known to most of us. Uh, long story short, Burgoyne launches an invasion down the Champlain Valley, goes to Saratoga, fights a few battles, gets defeated, and uh, American independence is secured uh, through French recognition of the uh, 13 colonies as a new nation. What transpired that summer? Why did Burgoyne fail? When you look at it on paper, Burgoyne's army seemed to have everything going with it. Uh, army of nearly 10,000 professionally trained European soldiers, well-equipped, heavy artillery, well-disciplined force, very competent subordinates. What went wrong? That's what we're here to find out today. But to start with, we have to go back two years to 1775. And very appropriate because we are here at the Ethan Allen House. The war, of course, starts April of 1775 with the events at Lexington and Concord. May of 1775, Ethan Allen and the Green Mountain Boys, plus Benedict Arnold, show up at Fort Ticonderoga. Ethan Allen raps on the door, come out of there, you damn old rat. They capture Ticonderoga, massive amount of ordnance. They also capture Crown Point. Well, Ethan Allen has his moment of glory. He decides to go up Lake Champlain later that summer, September of 1775, attacks Montreal very foolishly with 100 men, gets captured. Later on that fall, a two-pronged attack under Richard Montgomery coming up through Montreal to Quebec, another force under Benedict Arnold coming up the Dead River through the Maine wilderness, attack Quebec on December 31st, 1775 in an attempt to make Canada the 14th colony. The battle is fought in a raging snowstorm. General Montgomery is killed. Benedict Arnold is severely wounded. The Americans retreat out of the city and lay siege to Quebec during that winter. In the spring of 1776, a force of almost 10,000 British and regulars and German mercenaries known as Hessians come to the relief of Quebec. 
but while they are called Hessians by the Americans, these guys that come to Quebec are actually Brunswickers from the state of Brunswick. There is a small Hess contingent, uh, mostly from uh, Hess Hanau, but most of those forces are from Brunswick. The Americans that are holding Quebec retreat back down the Champlain Valley with the British in pursuit. The British forces are under the command of Guy Carleton. He had originally been Governor General of Canada. His second in command is John Burgoyne. Carleton and Burgoyne have the Americans on the run in the summer or fall of 1776. Benedict Arnold, recovered from his wounds, fights a desperate stand at Valcour Island in October of 76. By this point, the season is getting late. Carlton's men get almost to Fort Ticonderoga by the end of October. Well, if you've lived up here long enough, you know the weather starts getting really bad around that time. Unable to carry on the campaign, Carlton sails back up the lake, back to Montreal and Quebec to win her over his troops. The winter of 1776 into 1777, John Burgoyne goes back to England. His wife was severely ill, and he got permission to go back and take care of her. Now, Burgoyne is a very interesting character. He had entered the army, as most British officers did back then at a very early age. He had been a cavalry officer. He had won fame for himself in fighting in Portugal during the Seven Years' War, what we, call, what we called in the colonies the French and Indian War. So he does pretty well fighting in Portugal as a cavalry commander. And there he earned the nickname Gentleman Johnny, because in a time when most British commanders whipped their men, Burgoyne treated his soldiers like men and respected them, uh, treated them fairly well and earned their respect. He felt that these soldiers earned that in combat and he treated them very well. After that, he leaves the army for a bit, becomes a politician, enters parliament, and in parliament, he's actually very sympathetic to the American cause. Uh, he says in 1774, shortly before the outbreak of events in Massachusetts, that if the Americans are going to rebel over the taxes that we have imposed upon them, I really don't blame them. So he was very sympathetic to what was happening in the colonies at the time. The American Revolution breaks out, Burgoyne is promoted to Major General, is recalled to active duty, and even though he supported the American cause for a part, he comes over to the colonies, he's present on the field at Bunker Hill and watches the slaughter of the British troops there. 1776, he's appointed second in command for Canada, helps Carleton drive the Americans out of Canada, and now in the winter of 1776, he's back in London taking care of his sick wife. While he's there, he decides to write a little pamphlet for his own entertainment. Uh, Burgoyne was a uh, very good writer. He, had, he was a playwright. He had written several plays uh, both before and after the American Revolution. And he writes a pamphlet that he decides to circulate throughout Parliament and a copy of it eventually gets to His Majesty George III. And the pamphlet is called Thoughts on Conducting the War from Canada. And basically, without naming it, he lambasted Carleton, that Carleton should have destroyed the Americans, he should have kept on going, attacked Ticonderoga, and wintered over there and destroyed the American forces. But he has a pretty good idea for uh, cutting off uh, the snake from the head. Burgoyne, like most British at the time, thought that New England, us pesky Yankees, were the problem. The American Revolution started in Massachusetts, and the rest of the colonies were just followers on. If you could end the American Revolution in New England, the rest of the colonies would come back and be loyal to the king. So we want to crush what's going on in New England. To do that, Burgoyne comes up with a plan. A three-pronged assault 
would launch and combine in Albany and then march east to Boston. Under his plan, a large force under General Lord Howe, who commanded the main British army in New York City, would march north up the Hudson. A smaller force would head east from Oswego through the Mohawk Valley. And a third and a larger force would march south down Lake Champlain through the Hudson Valley to Albany. It's a great idea. Burgoyne comes up with the plan and some key points that he wrote in this pamphlet. Artillery was a necessity. Burgoyne felt that if he got to Ticonderoga and the Americans were still there, and you have to remember Ticonderoga and Mount Independence and Vermont across the way, very heavily fortified, almost 7,000 American soldiers holding these two places. If there was a siege, artillery would be needed. So Burgoyne decides that if he's going to do this plan, he needs a large artillery train. His second point, recruit the local populace. He would need French Canadian support. These French Canadians would be responsible for taking care of Burgoyne's supply line. Their horses, their wagons, they would help bring up the rear and secure the baggage, bringing it south down the lake. Number three, get the support of the local Native American population. Burgoyne felt that having local natives on his side who knew the terrain, knew the area, would basically be the eyes and ears of his army. Fourth, and most importantly, as he headed, he would leave a garrison in Canada, but as he marched down south, troops would also leave Canada in a second wave, garrisoning the points such as Ticonderoga and Lake George along the way, enabling him to keep his army together in case he had to fight the Americans along the way. So, he also puts in this pamphlet, by the way, I think I should be appointed to command this expedition. Well, like I said, King George III gets a copy of this pamphlet and decides, wow, that's a really good idea. I'm, I will appoint you to command the army in Canada. Sounds like a great idea on paper. Go back to Canada in 1777 and get it done. What George III doesn't do is tell General Howe, oh, by the way, you're going to cooperate with Burgoyne. Howe already had his own plan he had submitted to the Crown. He would take his army down out of New York, sail around the Delaware Cape, land in the Chesapeake Bay, and march up and capture Philadelphia. Burgoyne sails back to Canada without hearing that. He thought Howe was going to be marching north to his relief. So if you can imagine, already on paper in the spring of 1777, this thing is starting to fall apart. Gets back to Canada in May of 1777 and immediately begins getting his forces ready for the campaign. <clears throat> the British Army in Canada was a well-disciplined, well-trained fighting force. A lot of the troops had been involved in light infantry training and tactics over the winter or they had learned them previously in England. If you can imagine what you think in the movies where two sides, the British just stood there shoulder to shoulder in an open field blasting away. That's not how the British Army fought this war. The British Army throughout the American Revolution adapted their, their tactics, adapted their uniforms, and was able to fight the war on the continent. So a lot of these British soldiers had been trained to fight in the American style of warfare, fighting in open water, using cover, able to fight the Americans on their own terms. So Burgoyne takes with him the 9th, the 20th, 21st, 24th, the 47th, the 53rd, and the 62nd regiments. The 29th, 31st, and 34th British regiments are assigned back to Garrison, Canada. According to the pamphlet, those forces, those three regiments, 
would move south once he was on his way to garrison points along the lake. Guy Carlton pretty much is ticked off that he had been passed over for promotion taking command of this force. Carlton's orders were very simple. Garrison Canada with your available forces. Keep that in mind, Garrison Canada. Canada ends right on the 45th parallel, much as it does today. Burgoyne also had another division under his command of Brunswickers and some Hess troops under the command of Major General Rydazel. Rydazel, just like Burgoyne, had served in the Seven Years' War in Europe, very good, very competent commander. He would be very critical of Burgoyne in the following months. So Burgoyne has two divisions, the Brunswickers under Rydazel, the English troops under Major General Phillips. He also has a huge artillery train, almost 140 pieces. Things come to order in late June. He begins his sailing down the lake, disembarks his forces at Crown Point, marches overland, and goes to Fort Ticonderoga. There's some skirmishing out on the old French lines uh, with Warner's troops from Vermont on July 4th and July 5th. The morning of July 6th, however, the British have dragged two 12-pound guns up to the top of Mount Defiance. Basically, they could shoot straight down into the parade ground at Fort Ticonderoga. Arthur St. Clair, the American commander at Ticonderoga, decides live to fight another day and retreats. So basically, without firing a single cannon shot, Burgoyne has captured Crown Point and Ticonderoga. A large American contingent retreats out of Ticonderoga, headed to Rutland. The rear guard goes to Hubbardton to mop up, wait there for stragglers to come out. We all know what happens there on the morning of July 7th, 1777. The British attack the American rear guard. It's a seesaw battle back and forth. The Americans, if, if they had had more ammunition, more troops, would have won the Battle of Hubbardton. The British, under General Fraser, beat the Americans severely, capturing almost 250 of them. But the Americans hold on long enough for the rest of the American army to get to Rutland. The following morning, on July 8th, there's a nasty little battle down at Fort Ann, New York. The British 9th Regiment, uh, composing of four companies, is down there. They are ambushed by the 3rd New Hampshire Regiment. It's a very nasty battle. The British lose very heavily. That same day, Burgoyne captures the American fleet at Skanesboro, today's Whitehall, New York. So with the loss of about 200 men between the actions at Fort Ann, Ticonderoga, and Hubbardton, Burgoyne has completely driven the Americans from the northern part of the Champlain Valley. The main American army regroups in Rutland and Paulette and waits. Burgoyne starts bringing his supplies down the lake, sailing past Ticonderoga, landing at Skanesboro, now Whitehall, New York. This is when things start going poorly for Burgoyne's army. He had thought that those French Canadians would sign up in droves to help him carry those supplies down the lake and eventually overland. Pretty much the French Canadians wanted nothing to do with either side during the war. When the Americans launched their initial invasion of Canada in 1775, they thought the French Canadians would help them. But you've got to remember the year previous in 74, the Quebec Act. It had restored the Roman Catholic religion, French civil law, and the French language to Canada. So basically, from the British, the French Canadians had been granted their rights back. They wanted nothing to do with these American rebels. And now, 
that the British are launching their campaign down the Champlain Valley. They pretty much are want to live up there, farm, and do what they do. So only about 350 to 400 French Canadians sign up to help Burgoyne's army. The Indians that he had expected to show up in droves would come and go, come and go. They were mostly only concerned with uh, plundering, raiding the frontier, rather than fighting as an effective fighting force under Burgoyne. Another major problem. Burgoyne had hoped to get hundreds and hundreds of horses that would carry supplies once he got to Whitehall. Because he knew once he got to Whitehall, he'd have to go overland. Well, those horses and those wagons were nowhere to be found. The uh, French Canadians had to sell them to the British. He gets fewer than 100 wagons and fewer than 300 horses to carry tons of supplies for almost 10,000 men. Burgoyne has about 9,000 effective uh, fighting soldiers and about 1,000 auxiliaries, uh, those Indians, those French Canadians, and a lot of women that were following Burgoyne's army. Uh, keep in mind, women and children were considered part of the uh, force back then, uh, cooking, taking care of the wounded, and doing other things. So about 1,000 auxiliaries accompanying his army. So the Americans, by this point, it's about July 12th, they're regrouping in the Hampshire Grants. Well, Burgoyne, now that he's captured Ticonderoga, he pretty much seems unstoppable. Massachusetts and New Hampshire call up their entire militia contingents. And the New Hampshire militia, mostly tr men from the coast, are put on command of John Stark, and Stark is basically given the, direct the directive, march west and see what you can do to stop Burgoyne. Same thing with the militia in Berkshire County and Hampshire County in Massachusetts. There is very much fear on the frontier with Burgoyne's army headed south. So here we are, mid-July, and the Americans are doing everything they can to stop Burgoyne in a very interesting way. There's only wilderness wagon roads running south from Skanesboro, Whitehall, running through the frontier. So the American forces are cutting trees down across the road. They're draining, they're getting rid of dams, draining swamps, flooding areas, doing everything they can to stop Burgoyne's army. It's summertime. Illness starts to strike Burgoyne's army. Typhoid, dysentery, mosquito-borne ailments start to take an effect. His army now at this point is only down to about 8,000 effective fighting soldiers. He leaves a large contingent of sick men behind at Ticonderoga. Now remember what I said about that pamphlet he wrote. He expected the forces in Canada would come down and garrison the places he had captured. Carleton's orders from the king are to hold Canada. He only has three British and two German regiments to hold all of Canada. He didn't like John Burgoyne too much. He sends the 31st British Regiment to Point Off Fur, which is just south of Rouse's Point, New York, today right at the edge of where Canada ends and the United States begins. The 31st Regiment is there all summer. Burgoyne is begging Carlton, send them to my aid. The 31st literally stays at Point Off for all summer and does nothing. So now Burgoyne, when he realizes, I've got Fort Ticonderoga and Whitehall, this is my supply base, because he has his supplies coming south, down out of Montreal, down Lake Champlain, to Ticonderoga and Whitehall. He's got to leave men behind to garrison these places. So in mid-July, he decides to leave 
a British, the 53rd Regiment, and a German Regiment behind to garrison Mount Independence and Fort Ticonderoga. He also strips his artillery train down to about 40 pieces, light artillery, to take with him in the field. Leaves about 100 pieces of artillery behind at Ticonderoga. So his army is getting smaller. So now he's left almost 500 sick men behind. He's left almost 1,000 soldiers behind at Whitehall, Fort Ticonderoga, Mount Independence. He starts moving his army very slowly overland. Remember, he only has a certain number of carts and horses. He only had enough horses to pull those wagons and his artillery. He brought with him a battalion of Brunswick Dragoons. These are cavalrymen. They were used to going into battle mounted on horses. They would have been the eyes and ears of Burgoyne's army. If he had had horses, they would have been out there riding in front, looking for the Americans, going off on their own, looking for supplies. But now, by early August, Burgoyne has only advanced about 30 miles from Fort Ticonderoga, less than a mile a day. Illness, his army is starting to suffer from desertion. Supplies are starting to get fairly low. Because even though all summer long, those supplies keep on coming down by ship down the lake, once they get to Whitehall, they have to be dragged overland with these little tiny carts. And I'm talking about a cart pulled by two horses that maybe at most would hold a thousand pounds of supplies. That's not a lot to support an army of 7,500 men in the field. So he decides that we need supplies. We are going to go and get them from the Americans. And if they won't, if we'll offer them money. If, they, if not, we will take them by force. And so around August 12th, he hears that there is a huge American supply base at a certain town in the Hampshire Grants. Can anybody guess what town that is? Bennington. So Burgoyne thinks Bennington would be a very ripe target. Uh, he, had, he did have a very effective network of loyalists. Uh, you gotta remember, a lot of the early settlers in the Champlain Valley were soldiers who had fought for the crown during the French and Indian War. These men have been given land grants for their service, so when Burgoyne's army shows up, a lot of these veterans who had fought 15, 20 years earlier go and join his army. So Burgoyne has between three to 400 loyalists with him. And he hears about the supply dump at Bennington, and he hears there's horses he can get for his dragoons, plenty of supplies, pretty much everything he needs. So, <clears throat> he decides to send Frederick Baum and about a thousand of his men off to Bennington. And history has been very unkind to Baum. Base Baum was the commander of the Brunswick Dragoon Battalion. And basically, history has told us that Burgoyne sent a mishmash of forces that uh, Baum was a very poor choice, he didn't speak any English. Well, very few of the uh, Brunswick officers spoke English. Uh, the language that they actually used, the lingua franca between the two forces, was French. If Burgoyne wanted to talk to the Brunswickers, he would address them in French rather than in German. So, history hasn't been too kind to Baum, but Baum was about to do the best that he could. He took with him his own Dragoon Battalion, a battalion of uh, Brunswick Light Infantry, all of the provincials, the loyalists, some Indians, and about 50 uh, British soldiers. Well, lo and behold, near Bennington around the same time is John Stark's New Hampshire Militia Brigade and another brigade of Bruns of militia from Western Massachusetts. Well, we all get August 16th off, or the, what is it, third Monday in um, August. So we know what happens there at Bennington on August 16th. It's pretty much a bloodbath 
for that force. In the course of the fighting there, Stark's men destroy Baum's original column. Another column marching to Baum's relief is also pretty much destroyed in form. So in the course of one day, Burgoyne pretty much loses a thousand men with nothing to show for it. So he's lost a thousand men out of his army. But his, his reaction to this is pretty much what you would expect from an English nobleman. Well, they weren't English. He, he felt that the fighting strength of his army was those British regiments that he brought with him. And he basically looked at the Germans as an encumbrance. General Rydazel, who commands the uh, Brunswick forces that Burgoyne takes with him, uh, really, really, you read his diary, really hated the man. He felt that Burgoyne was very arrogant, didn't know what he was doing, and uh, needlessly slaughtered the Brunswick troops at Bennington. So Rydazel really never forgave Burgoyne for what happened that day. No supplies to show for what happens there at Bennington. Again, very slowly, the army continues to work its way south. Mid-August, we have another little event going on out here in central New York. Remember, part of the campaign plan was for another British column to head east through the Mohawk Valley to link up with Burgoyne. That force is under Barry St. Ledger. And St. Ledger marches his men in late July through the Mohawk Valley. He tries to lay siege to Fort Stanwix. The Americans manage to hold off at Stanwix. There's a nasty battle fought at Oriskany. And eventually, when American reinforcements uh, turn from Albany and head to the relief of Stanwix, St. Ledger retires and goes back to Oswego. <clears throat> so part of Burgoyne's plan is falling apart. Then he also gets the news from General Clinton, who's down here in New York. He was left in charge of New York when Howe decides to sail down the Champlain, the um, Chesapeake Bay and attack Philadelphia. And Clinton basically tells Burgoyne through a secret letter, I basically only have enough troops to garrison New York City. Howe has taken the army. I don't know where he's gone, but I'm not coming to help you. That's paraphrasing it. So Burgoyne, if you can imagine what he felt sitting in his tent that night in late August, realizing he is all alone. He has left behind 1,200 men now to garrison Ticonderoga, Mount Independence, garrison uh, Fort George at the tip of Lake George. All the while, his supplies keep on coming down the lake. Sent overland in those little two-horse carts and building up his supply dump. But these, these soldiers, just like soldiers today, eat a lot of food. They're going through pork, bread, rum, peas, oatmeal, the staples of the army very quickly. So Burgoyne realizes he's got to act. But he was one of these types of stubborn people. He was already committed. He was this far south. He's about 45 miles from Albany. And even though he realizes that reinforcements were not coming, he decides to head south anyway. So what's happening on the other side? Burgoyne keeps on marching south, going about a mile, two miles a day. Not very much, but making some progress. Well, in the American side, uh, Arthur St. Clair, who led the uh, evacuation out of uh, Ticonderoga, he's pretty much uh, been sidelined. Uh, Philip Schuyler, who is in command of the Northern Department, Congress pretty much didn't like him and sent him packing as well. So they appoint to command of the Northern Army General Gates. Now Horatio Gates 
had served in the British Army. His first regiment he served in, he was a junior second lieutenant with John Burgoyne in the same British regiment. Uh, he fought in the French and Indian War on the side of the British, came over to America afterwards, uh, settled in Virginia, and at the outbreak of the American Revolution, uh, joined the American side. Gates was a fantastic adjutant general. That was his first job un under George Washington. Basically, he was in charge of all the paperwork, uh, the quartermaster, basically keeping the army running. And he was a fantastic adjutant general in the early stages of the American Revolution when the Americans were laying siege to the British forces around Boston. A very, very poor field commander. You can imagine, uh, fast forward a little bit to the Civil War, you've probably all heard of George McClellan. George McClellan was a fantastic administrator. Placed in command of an army in the field, he utterly failed. Gates, however, is a senior major general, and Congress feels that he's up to the task of leading the, the Northern Department. So they send him to Albany to take command. They also send up a division of troops from Washington's army, which has moved south to the Philadelphia area to counter Howe. They send a division north of Continental regulars, mostly troops from Massachusetts and New York, to counter Burgoyne. They also send up about 450 riflemen under Daniel Morgan, troops from Virginia and Pennsylvania. They'll come in very handy later on. While these troops are marching north, uh, Burgoyne's uh, Native American allies are uh, running around on the frontier. And uh, in August, they go to what's today Glens Falls and uh, raid a local farm. And uh, the, what happened there has you know, been mythicized, uh, led to history. But the fact uh, that remains, an American woman named uh, Jane McRae is killed. Uh, by Burgoyne's uh, native allies. McRae's death becomes a rallying call for the local militia throughout New York, Massachusetts, Connecticut, uh, New Hampshire. Basically, Burgoyne's forces are going and doing this. If they can kill Jane McRae, they can come to your farm, kill your family. You've got to take the field to come and stop this. So thousands and thousands of American militiamen respond to the call. By this point, with both militia, continentals, Gates's force outnumbers Burgoyne almost two to one. Gates comes up with a very good idea. By this point, early September, Burgoyne has crossed to the west bank of the Hudson River, and there's, a, there's actually a real road now. He's not just hacking his way through the wilderness. There's a road running parallel to the Hudson River right to Albany. Gates has the idea, well, he has to come right down this road to get to Albany. Let's fortify the heights around Saratoga. So if Burgoyne has to attack, he'll run right into my defenses and we'll get him there. So Burgoyne crosses the Hudson River with about 7,000 men. Remember, he's lost almost 2,000 since we started. It's September. Mid-September, nights are starting to get cold. At this point, I honestly feel if he wanted to, Burgoyne could have gotten out of there with most of his army and gotten back to Canada. If not, wintered at Ticonderoga and then gone back the following year. He knows the Americans have fortified the heights around Saratoga. He decides, as he was a gambler, I'm going to attack. September 19th, dawns bright and clear. The Americans see the British marching down. Gates orders out his riflemen under Daniel Morgan to open up the ball. Beyond the scope of the presentation today, but long story short, it's a very bloody, very deadly battle that happens around Bemis Heights. 
The British attack and counterattack time and again, bayonet charge after bayonet charge. They try to clear the field. The Americans regroup, launch a counterattack. By nightfall, the British hold the field. The Americans were driven back into their fortifications, but they've killed or wounded almost 1,500 British and German soldiers on the field. Now, the British way of thinking, if you hold the field, you've won the battle. Well, the British technically, for their own thinking, won that first battle of Saratoga. They drove the Americans back into their entrenchments, but they lost 1,500 men for only about 300 American casualties that day. So it was pretty much a turkey shoot. The British 62nd Regiment went into action with about 400 men and came out with about 75. For 19, 18th century combat, casualties of those numbers are horrendous. Burgoyne holds the field. So he brings up his army and digs in in a fortified trench, series of entrenchments facing the Americans about a mile to the south. So for the next three weeks, it's pretty much a standoff. The British are here in a fortified encampment facing off against the Americans about a mile to the south. Neither side really willing to do anything for three weeks. Well, in those three weeks, things go from really bad to absolutely horrible for Burgoyne's army. All the supplies that he had left at Fort George, at the very southern tip of Lake George, pretty much um, where um, Lake George Village is today, those supplies had all been brought up. His army was running out of food. Uh, first to go, they ran out of uh, bread, hardtack of the time. They were pretty much reduced to living on pork, peas, and rum. Burgoyne just waits. He's expecting any day that Clinton or somebody will come to his relief. So he waits and waits and waits. Rydazel and Phillips, Phillips is the British, uh, commander of the British division under Burgoyne, are begging him. We need to get out of here. We need to get out of here. He's waiting in this fortified encampment for anybody to come to his relief. Doug Cubison, who's a very prominent historian, has studied this uh, campaign in detail, uh, wrote in one of his books that he believes Burgoyne had a nervous or mental breakdown sometime around September 30th at this point. Um, it, the weather is very bad, freezing rain, snow. A lot of the soldiers are out in the open without uh, any real protection other than their blankets, uh, thin tents. They're pretty much starving at this point. Uh, he had uh, done, uh, Cubison had done some archeological work around where Burgoyne's headquarters were and found tons and tons of liquor bottles around there, indicating that Burgoyne brought an inordinate amount of rum champagne south with him. There was plenty of room in the wagons and the carts for Burgoyne's personal baggage while his men were pretty much starving at this point. But Cubison believes, and I believe uh, his research, based on what I've read about it, that Burgoyne suffers this mental and nervous breakdown around September 30th when he realizes nobody is coming to his relief. So we have Rydazel and Phillips begging Burgoyne to retreat. September 21st, meanwhile, Burgoyne's communications with Canada have been severed. John Brown launches a raid at Fort Ticonderoga, almost captures the fort. He captures five companies of the British 53rd Regiment, lays siege to the fort for a few days, burns the outer works, and then turns south attacks the British garrison at Lake George, and then marches on to join up with the force under Gates. So pretty much now, Burgoyne is surrounded. He's outnumbered almost three to one. 
his, his line of communication with Canada for Ticonderoga is gone. He's suffered some type of breakdown. His men are starving, and nobody's coming to help him. So he decides that on October 7th, that morning, he has to do something. And he decides to launch what's called a reconnaissance in force. He would personally take 1,500 of his men in a wide, swooping arch around the American entrenchments and try to find some way around. Well, that morning, Benedict Arnold is uh, out there looking at the British, and he sees this uh, movement. And Arnold had had a very prominent uh, role in the first battle of Saratoga, the one at Bemis Heights. And he hated Gates. He felt Gates had not given him any recognition in his official report. He had a huge beef with Gates, and Gates had relieved him of command. So basically, Arnold had spent the last three weeks just hanging around, doing nothing, waiting for something. So that morning, Arnold sees Burgoyne leading his men out of the entrenchments, trying to find their way around the American left flank. He gets a pail of rum, drinks it, literally drinks a pail of rum, gets on his horse, waves his sword, and leads about 2,000 Americans out to face the British. The battle is literally over in about five minutes. The Americans destroy this British flanking column. Arnold turns his horse towards the main British encampment, and the Americans, by the end of the day, have pretty much swept over and destroyed what's left of Burgoyne's army. Uh, Arnold, of course, severely wounded in the leg. When we know what happens later on, becomes a traitor. That's another story for another day. But Arnold wins the second battle of Saratoga for the Americans. The Americans sweep over, destroy whatever's left of Burgoyne's supply dump. And Burgoyne retreats about five miles north to the village of Saratoga. For the next two weeks, the Americans, very much like a boa constrictor, squeeze in, squeeze in. And finally, on October 14th, Burgoyne decides to open up uh, communications with Gates, uh, asking for uh, terms of surrender. Gates is first. Gates feels that Burgoyne would be coming asking for terms, and basically his he asks right away for unconditional surrender. Well, in the 18th century, that was pretty much uh, unimaginable. A defeated enemy was allowed uh, to propose terms, and Burgoyne comes back with a list of 11 points that uh, he wants to agree to uh, with Gates. Uh, a lot of the troops, a lot of the Canadians, the women, etc., would be allowed to go back to Canada. Um, the British soldiers would be allowed to lay down their arms and go back to England and Germany as long as they fought no more on the continent. Gates thought this was a good idea, signs the Convention of Saratoga on October 17th. The British German troops march out of their encampments, lay down their arms, and go to Boston. Uh, long story short, uh, the convention is not ratified by the British. Because if this, the terms of the surrender are ratified by the British, they have to acknowledge that the United States is an independent nation. So they refuse to ratify this convention. Also at the same time, there were some discrepancies about the number of men. A lot of troops were able to escape back to Canada. So pretty much for the next four years, Congress holds Burgoyne's army hostage, waiting for Britain to ratify the convention. Never happens. Burgoyne eventually goes back uh, to England the following year. Um, he's a disgraced general. Um, he goes back to Parliament, never has an official uh, court of inquiry, and pretty much uh, lives out the rest of his days writing plays and drinking very heavily. So, long story short, what happens? The Americans win an amazing victory. The news gets to France. France realizes, hey, the Americans can win a battle against the British. They defeated a British army. 
Although, believe it or not, most of the American troops, the militia, excuse me, the Continentals fighting at, at Saratoga, they were armed with French guns. The French had been helping us since day one. But now that we've defeated the British in open field combat, they feel ready to support the American cause, give open support, and of course, the convention, it's ratified. France, later Holland, and Spain recognize the United States as an independent nation, and the rest is history. But why did Burgoyne fail? Why did all of this happen? It was a domino, a series of events that led to this spectacular victory and the securing of American independence. A fellow by the name of George Stanley was a Canadian uh, historian, and he wrote a book about this back in the 1950s. And the, I think the title of his book sums it all up, For Want of a Horse. And Burgoyne had, on paper, everything going for him, especially when he captured Ticonderoga almost without firing shot, without laying siege to the fort, the supplies, the logistics. Studying the war from London, 3,000 miles away, the folks who were planning this campaign were not used to the realization of what would happen once this army started moving south. Burgoyne felt that, the troop, that once he left Canada, the supplies would keep on coming down. He was not able to get those carts to secure those supplies. The horses never showed up in the amount needed. Likewise, he was able to, he had to leave a lot of his troops behind to garrison points along the way. The, the support he was expecting from the French Canadians and the native allies never really materialized. So he's fighting all summer, losing men by the dozens through battle, through disease, leaving them behind. And by the time he finally gets to Saratoga, his supply line is stretched all the way back to Montreal and Quebec. The supplies, they're slow coming. His men are sick. They're starving. And in the end, I think it ri the best summary of why this happened was left by Major Henry Dearborn, who commanded a, an American Light Infantry Battalion under Gates. And he wrote about what happened on September 19th. We had something more at stake than fighting for 10 pence per day. The Americans had something more at stake in this battle than the British did. They, were, they knew what was at stake, and they were willing to fight and to die to cut off Burgoyne's supplies from heading south, ultimately achieving American independence through the great victory in the Saratoga campaign. Thank you. <laughs> I'd love to take some questions if you got them. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Um, maybe you can clarify this. I'm, I'm not sure, but what I've read, so when Benedict Arnold goes to head off the Burgoyne's flanking maneuver, yes. I, I always understood that he was successful at first, but then he was ordered back by Gates and not to push on. Is that true or not? Uh, yes. He, like I said, he literally drank a pail of rum at that morning. Um, so he's drunk as a skunk. And once Gates realizes, he thought Arnold had gone back to Albany three weeks earlier. He didn't even know Arnold was there. And so he realizes, hey, Arnold's out there. Arnold shouldn't be there. Come back. But at this point, Arnold was already in the thick of it, destroying that first British force and then turning to the Balcares uh, redoubt where he's wounded. Um, so Gates does order Arnold back, but Arnold basically said, see you later. I'm, I'm going to do this. And if Arnold... If Arnold had died on the morning of October 7th, 1777, he literally would have been the biggest hero of the American Revolution. And it's, it's too bad for history that Arnold did not die that morning because he would have been remembered as a great hero. Yes, sir. Um, Johnny Burgoyne and Barry Westminster Abbey. I believe so, yes. And, and I'm trying to, it seems to me, I'm amazed that he gained that honor, considering this is one of the biggest British defeats ever. 
And I, it I, sort I, of leads me to believe that why Benedict Arnold jumped ship in time, because I think to some extent a lot of these generals and commanders were put into service because they had a lot of money. Yes. Okay? And Benedict Arnold did not. No. All right? And so to some extent he was jealous of that, and, it, and it, of course jumped ship later on because of that. That's my theory. And, and uh, you are correct um, with, with Burgoyne being very wealthy. Um, he had married, he married in the money. He basically came from nothing. He married in the money. Arnold, Arnold had extensive militia experience before the war. So he was very competent in that way. And also he had, I mean, look at what he did at, um, you know, uh, Quebec, uh, leading the attack through Maine. Um, likewise, in 1776 at uh, Valcour Island, uh, seven, um, August of 1777, we, usually, well, we don't forget, Arnold is the guy who leads those American reinforcements to Stanwitz. And that's sort of a forgotten chapter. Um, but Arnold, you know, you know, Willard Strode Randall is sort of the expert on that. But, um, you know, Arnold, Arnold jumped ship, I think, later on because he just, he felt he had no recognition, no support. And, you know, he, he honestly, for the first two years of the American Revolution, he was the revolution in the Northern Department. He kept everything together up here. To quote uh, Randall, um, one of the ideas behind Arnold's defection was that he actually hoped to replicate the role of General Monk in the English Civil War. That is to bring the two sides together at the end and stop the hostilities. Interesting, I've never heard of that. That's in, uh, in book. I have a copy uh, somewhere, but if you can hear the little lady out there, I don't read too much anymore. <laughs> uh, yes, sir. Um, I think it's a, I'm not sure it's a viable approach to a distant war to give your commanders the freedom to make decisions, particularly with the level of communications. And so how making a decision to go to Philadelphia is not necessarily surprising. I don't know how the British ran the campaigns, but to set up something with such stakes as a three-pronged attack to sever New England off and not have the other commanders committed <clears throat> to meeting at all costs is, how does that happen? <laughs> well, uh, how, how was the commander-in-chief uh, for the, North, for the you know, American uh, department? So pretty much the king gave, gave him parameters and his idea you know, it was back then, well, if you capture the capital, they should capitulate. And that was, that was the idea in European ways of fighting. It wasn't, oh, Washington, oh, we captured Philadelphia. Well, Washington just, you know, retreated into the hinterland and, you know, fought a guerrilla war against their supply lines. So, you know, it is very much that European thinking of fighting that if you capture a capital, if you capture a large portion of men, well, they should just give up. But the Americans have so much at stake that, I mean, literally Washington is defeated time and again, but still, you know, holds on. So how had the authority to make that decision? Yes. And may never have known Burgoyne had those orders? Or uh, he, knew, he knew Burgoyne was, was headed south, but he, he had already committed the forces to going to, um, to Philadelphia. There was... There was a lot of bad, there's a really good book, The Men Who Lost America. There was a lot of bad blood among the commanders on the, at the time. Um, likewise, you know, with, um, with Clinton, you know, he, he just made a thing up, up as far as um, just south of uh, West Point, um, rather than, you know, advancing up. Uh, yes, sir. Dan Morgan's uh, men were known as sharpshooters. Yes. But the weapons they had were smooth bore, weren't they? Morgan, Morgan's riflemen are armed with rifles. So at the start of the American Revolution, there's a lot of little independent rifle companies that show up. By 1777, Washington has basically taken all those rifles away from these little independent companies, most of them from Pennsylvania, Kentucky. So what happened in the um, June of 1777, when Daniel Morgan is organizing his rifle corps to march north to help out Gates, Washington has a competition, a shooting competition, 
down in Pennsylvania. It's about 400 men. These 400 men are armed with rifles. Everybody else is armed with smoothbores. So uh, the problem with a rifle takes a while to reload. So the riflemen were always paired with uh, musket men armed with bayonets in order to support each other. And the American Light Infantry under Henry Dearborn, those are the two forces that go out and, you know, open the battle on September 19th. Well, this American response to all this going campaign that's all directed by Washington. Washington sends his forces uh, further north. Um, the response the response to it is largely under Gates, but Washington uh, does cooperate with him. Washington is the overall American commander. Even though he commands what's called the main army, Washington commands all American forces wherever they are. So whether they're in South Carolina or Maine, Washington is in charge. So we get directions to them to come by like doing more than two things. Exactly. I will gladly uh, stick around after um, for additional questions. Um, I could talk about this uh, all day, but thank you so much. We have a little uh, extra something for you afterwards, so you can stick around for two more minutes, okay? Instead of our usual mug, we are giving away one of our t-shirts well, here today. Well, I, I appreciate this because being a new father, I go through clothes uh, quite a bit, so thank you. And John has something to uh, tell you. Okay, first of all, we have an announcement uh, for our next talk. It is on uh, May 19th. We're back to the third Sunday of the month as our normal schedule. And the speaker is Paul Giles. And maybe, I don't know if you know him, from he's a lawyer from Montpelier. Is that how he pronounces it? It's spelled Gildes, but I think he pronounces it Giles. Yeah. He has a new book that was uh, published in the past few months by the Vermont Historical Society called The Law of the Hills, A Judicial History of Vermont. So he'll be talking a lot about our early laws. And uh, he is an excellent speaker. He was here a few years ago, and uh, he'll be here next month. Okay? And before you go, in honor of General Burgoyne, we have a General Burgoyne coffee mug that we will have as a door prize. So what I'd like you to do right now is think of a number between 1 and 100, okay? And we're just going to go around the room and uh, see what we get. 14, 3, 87, 70. 17. 63. 62. 48. 24. 4. 77. Nobody's gotten it yet. <laughs> <laughs> For those of you in the back that are running out of numbers, okay, so eliminate all those numbers and now you have a chance. 43. 97. 59. 1. 48. 47. 48. 48. 48. 48. 48. 48. 48. 48. 48. 48. 48. 48. 100, 100, 16. 99. Oh, yeah. 31. 83. 23. 50. 73. 50. Would you believe that nobody got the exact oh. number? Oh. However, right towards the end, uh, today is the 28th. Yeah. If you reverse the digits, you get 82. 82. And that's the number that I have down here, 82. Oh, so you want to so check perfect. it out. Yep, I can, I can test 82. Yeah. You know it so it's way in the back, uh, 83. We had to come on up and get your mug. Okay. All right, here's the mug for Robert Conley. Bob Conley makes a new commercial. He and his wife, Christine. And uh, if you have a, a favorite general or a favorite historical figure, and if you don't have your, the mugs on our shelves, or if you have a favorite relative that you'd like to have put on the mug, uh, you can talk to Bob before you leave today. All right, thank you all for coming, and uh, we hope to see you next month.